praise the Lord and greetings in Jesus' name. Uh, please turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Let me read verses 17, 18, 23, and 24. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 17, 18, 23, and 24. Can I have the slide, please? Um, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with Wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Verse 23. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. The last verse for today. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. The title for this morning's message is Christ Crucified, the Power and Wisdom of God. Paul, writing this letter to the church in Corinth, he says the church of God in Corinth, all that are called as saints, wherever you are, He goes on to address first about unity in the church. He says, some of you are writing and some of you are saying that I am of Paulos or Paul. I am of Cephas. I am of Stephanus. And Paul says, is Christ divided? Did I baptize you, but did you, were you baptized in the name of Paul? And Paul goes on to say, is Christ divided? But he had made it very clear that he had not been sent to baptize, but to preach the gospel of Christ. So the very purpose of a church is to present Christ. It is not that I am of this church or I am of that church. Not of this denomination or that denomination. Or not of this group or that group. That's what Paul was saying. Unity needs to be there before you present Christ. If a divided Christ or if a divided church presents Christ, it's not going to be effective. That's why he uses the word, words of wisdom, of human wisdom. Preaching of the cross, he says, is foolishness to them that perish. But to them that are saved as we are, it is the power of God. So Paul goes on to say that it was not the primary purpose of trying to present the gospel for baptism. But, and baptism was important, but he made it clear that he was sent not to baptize. He said, I did baptize a few, and I do not remember if there were others too. But he was making, making it clear, saying that he was sent only to preach the gospel. Now the gospel has power. And that's why he says it's the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now, in in Corinth, a place where there was sexual impurity, where there was extravagant living, where there was a lot of sinful, wasteful of resources, of everything that was happening that was against God's word, he established a church. A church that was young. And this church is where... Paul was very much concerned with. And he said it was important to know that Christ is not divided. And he also said that it was the power of God. Meaning that he was all going on to say that to the Jews it's a stumbling block. Crucified Christ was a stumbling block. Because they always believed that Jesus would come as the Messiah. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. But not as they expected to be crucified on a tree. So, but to the Greeks, it was foolishness. So, if you look at the world today around you and me, in the corridors of power, be it in this nation or around the world, you see that it's just foolishness. How could they believe a living Christ was once crucified and he was risen? For them, it was foolishness. 
But if you look at the gospel, Jesus came to preach the gospel of Christ. And he passed on that message to his disciples saying, go and preach the gospel. So when it comes to the word crucified, and unto the Jews a stumbling gog, and, 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 and to the Greeks foolishness, Paul was telling that it is crucified Christ is powerful. Now how could it be so powerful? Think about it. In the first, in the second chapter of Acts, on the day of Pentecost, when the disciples were in the upper room, and very soon as we know the Holy Ghost fell upon them, Peter, he just addressed the Jews as they were in doubt of what was happening. Now it says that there were Jews from 16 nations listed here in that chapter. And he addressed them and said, and he preached the gospel of Christ. He presented Christ to them boldly. But at the very end, we see that just because of one sermon, by one person, in one language, to 16 nations, 3,000 people came to, the power, came to the knowledge of Christ. That is the power of the gospel. But as you see, later on, when Stephen presented Christ, he was stoned to death. But was not the gospel powerful? Yes, it was powerful. But it, the Jews, they said it was a stumbling block to them. They considered it as a stumbling block. They did not accept Christ and they stoned him to death. But remember, the power of God still worked in a man named Saul. And he became the one to write this gospel or write this letter to the church in Corinth. So when we look at the world, the world seems to be doing exactly what these people did, considering everything as foolishness. Now, let's look back at the power of God again. So, the power of God here is wisdom of words was not very effective. Look at this word. He says, if I preach wisdom of words, it's going to be of no effect. So, when you and I present Christ, is this what is happening? Sometimes, is it not effective? Why is it not effective? It may be because it's not the wisdom of God, but the wisdom of words. Human wisdom. See, that is what you see everywhere around the world. Human wisdom is projected. Knowledge is projected. Achievements are projected. Not, not about God. Not of the power of God. And so we see that souls are not saved. So as we look here, see, he, he never glorified in his flesh. But he was always making it sure that wherever he went, that he would present Christ boldly. He was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, but he believed it's the power of God unto salvation to all them that are of Jews or Greeks. Irrespective of who they were, where they come from, he presented, the Christ, presented Christ boldly. So, let's come back to this verse again. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Now, Bible says in John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever ever believeth in him should not perish. See, that's God's first plan. Not to perish. He did not want any soul to perish in this world. And so the gospel was there to save man from perishing. End was destruction. But he had kept eternal life for them. Amen. So the gospel of Christ was for you and me that we may not perish in our sins. Amen. So that, now again in the letter to the Romans, Paul says, scarcely for a righteous man would someone die. But Christ died for us while we were at sinners. Think of that verse. Scarcely for a righteous man would you or me or anybody, if your friend is imprisoned, would you go and substitute for him and say, I would be in prison for this man? Or if he is to be executed the next day, would you go and tell him, well, I would be executed in his place because I'm his friend? No. That's what the Bible says. Even if it happens, scarcely for a righteous man would someone die. For the good of mankind, or for good people, for righteous people, people are not willing to give themselves to others. And even if it's so, the numbers I do not know, even if it could be one in a million, it says scarcely for righteous men would someone die. That is the power of the gospel. The power of God saved you and me while we were at sinners. This power is so effective today when it is operated in the wisdom of God. 
But when it is with human words, it is not effective. I still remember. One day, I asked God this question. Why is it I don't see souls saved? Well, just like you, and just, just like us, many are sowing seeds into the kingdom of God. But we do not see many souls saved. Think about Peter. Think about Peter. He was just one man. To 16 nations, from different languages, 3,000 people were saved. But look at the other end, what is happening today. Not 3,000, many more than 3,000 preachers are preaching in many nations of the world, but we do not see even 100 souls saved sometimes. Why? Why is it so ineffective? Maybe it's human words, or maybe we do not travail in birth. So as I was asking God the same question, the very following Sunday, as I sat in this church, God spoke to Pastor John Vergis, and he talked about travailing in birth for souls. And that's what Paul says. I, little children, I travail in birth until Christ form, be formed in you. So it may be there is no labor, for, labor pain in us for souls that we don't see people accept Christ. But what did Paul go on to say? In a second, in a second part, he says, in that letter to Galatians, he says, if I glory, I do not glory in the flesh. God forbid that I glory only in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, unto whom the world is crucified, unto me and I unto the world. Amen. See, this is what makes the difference between Paul and the rest of the people in this present world, who are preaching, who are teaching, who are presenting gospel, going as missionaries, it's not that they are not effective. They are effective, but not as this man. What made the difference? He says, the world has nothing in me. I have nothing in this world. Think about this. He says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. It's not I, but Christ that liveth in me. And he goes on to say, if I live in the flesh, I live in the faith in the Son of God. And there's another verse that we sometimes neglect or sometimes ignore, or sometimes we do not pay attention. He says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. I do not frustrate the grace of God. Now, in the book of Romans, he again says, do we sin that grace may abound? That means, I go on to sin. What if I had gossiped yesterday, and I repented for it? Do I gossip tomorrow, because grace is still available? Or if I had committed sin in my, with my eyes, I know that grace is available. It's okay. I repent and turn back to God. And so grace, God's grace is still available. Well, that is frustrating God's grace. Paul standing in front of the council, facing Ananias, the chief priest. He said, in all conscience, before God, I have lived. So he says, men and brethren, my conscience was clear before God. Immediately, Ananias said to those standing close to him, he said, strike him on his mouth. And he immediately said, you whited ball, you judge me, he accused the chief priest. Immediately, the other people standing beside him said, he is the chief priest. He immediately said, I wist not, meaning I did not know that. He said, immediately he said, it is written that we should not speak evil of the ruler. That is the example he said, not frustrating God's grace, admitting that he was wrong, saying that his flesh was crucified and that he had no right to accuse the chief priest, even though he, what he was doing was wrong. That's God's grace, that he did not frustrate that we do sometimes. It may be because the world in us, see, we live in a world that we are so much involved. Now, as the word of God says, and the parable of the sower says, we are sometimes choked by the cares of this world that the word of God does not work in us. Likewise, we have so much of cares in this world that we sometimes be a part of this world and not crucified unto the world. But Paul was not like that. Paul, when he meant he was crucified, he did never glorify in his flesh. He acknowledged that it was the grace of God. See, he said, what I am, what I am today, is by God's grace. Amen. See, when he always confessed something, whether he was sent to preach, or whether he was sent to teach, 
or to baptize, he acknowledged God's grace. If you look at the letters to Colossians, to the Corinthians, to the Ephesians, to the Philippians, he always addresses the grace. Grace be unto you. He, he said, and he never meant that grace was something to be taken lightly. But we sometimes, in our flesh, we take credit for what we have done. Maybe at work, maybe at school, maybe in our family, maybe somewhere else. But Paul was making it clear, the world has nothing in me. That means, look, world cannot claim anything in my life. That he gave the world the glory and not Jesus. But we cannot tell the same every day of our lives. Maybe in a few days we might probably proclaim it's all God's grace. But then later on we sometimes forget to acknowledge and frustrate the grace of God. But Paul, he says here very clearly that I have no interest in this world. The world has no interest in me. We go our parallel ways. But I, yet in this world, preach the gospel because that's what I was sent to you. So this is where the next thing that we need to understand. Is it because the world in is us to a certain extent that we are not able to travail in birth and win souls for Christ and see souls saved somewhere? Of course we give tracts. Of course we present Christ. Yes, but sometimes that labor of pain is not there in us. Why? Sometimes we say, hey, how's it going? Good. Maybe it's a stranger. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's a colleague who you see every day. But that's it. Maybe in a mall as we go back, we see a crowd around us. Shopping, something doing daily like you and me do. Something for their daily needs. But as we look around, we don't weep like Paul here. Paul said about enemies of the cross of Christ, he said, weeping, that they weep. He wept even for believers. How much more I believe would have wept for unbelievers. He had that burden. So, but we, when we, whether it's in a mall, or in a marketplace, or in a store, or in a workplace, we do not have that great burden as he had. To actually travail in birth, constantly it's painful. See, when we are hurt, when we face a mountain, when we know there is no other way, when we cannot move an inch further, when we think that is very difficult, our pain is great. And we just want to cast it before God. Do we have the same pain when we think about souls? And the answer for me is no. And if you're honest enough, you will tell the answer as the same. But Paul was consistent. It was not that the world was crucified on, on few days of a week and the rest of it he was fine. No, never. It was always the same. Finally, let me come to the third part of the message. Enemies of the cross. In his letter to the church in Philippi, in chapter 3, he says, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and told you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Amen. Now, those who persecute the Christians in communist nations and many other nations of the world are not the enemies. They are the persecutors of the church. Just like Saul was, became Paul, and once he was a persecutor, they are the persecutors of the gospel. They, of course, imprison people. They put them in labor camps. And they definitely torture them too. But, and of course, there are, if you've recently read what's happening in China, in many churches, on the top of the churches, are crosses kept. Crosses are removed across many, many parts of China. But that's, they are not the enemies of the cross of Christ. They are not the enemies of the cross of Christ. Paul talks about these enemies right in the church in Corinth. They walk just like everybody walks. Which means they are believers like you and me. They are among the same congregation that we sit and worship. But their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. They mind earthly things. Their glory is a shame. So which, what does that mean? Who are the enemies of the cross of Christ? People who worship with us. Who, people who gather for crusades with us. People who preach on the pulpit with us. People who teach with us. Could also be the enemies of the cross of Christ. Am I an enemy? Are you an enemy? Is our end destruction? Sometimes we don't ever think it seriously. Our glory 
their glory is a shame. Shameful things that cannot be told to others, but hidden in secret, which only God sees, is the glory. God is their belly, just not food alone. Their focus is a physical being. This, that's where Paul has been victorious. He never cared for his own physical being. Physical fitness, physical being, well-being, myself, myself, my self-centered life, my selfish life is what it means. God is their belly. Now, the gospel for gain is what Paul was talking about in some places. Gospel for gain. But what did Paul say in another letter? Godliness with contentment is great gain. So what he was meaning is that you and I should be godly. You and I should be crucified in this world. And the world should be crucified unto us. You and I should preach the gospel. Yes, that's true. But what more he was telling? That this gospel is to be presented the way you present it. But our focus is not the self. Our focus is not myself, but the kingdom of God. That's why the word of God again says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be unto you. But we have this as one of the many priorities in our life to present Christ. Then he says, Mind earthly things. Now, earthly things are important for you and for me. And we are caught up in it so much every day of our lives. Just we cannot ignore it, that is true. But the Bible says, set your affections on things above and not on things above. Now, why was Paul weeping? Just before this verse that you read in verse 19, just before that, I think it was in verse 14 or 15, where he says, I press toward the mark of the high calling of God. His goal was eternity. That great price that he was looking for. But in the very following verse, he says, I'm weeping. Why? Their end is destruction. His end was the eternal life that he was looking for. A crown that he would get one day. Looking, he is leaving things that are beha- before, behind him. Reaching forth unto things that he needed in life. Counting everything that is dung behind him. And the cross before him. And he was preaching the cross. Pressing towards the goal. But sadly he was weeping for the others. Because they were mining earthly things. Setting the, uh, the, the affection of things on this earth. Rather than things above. Now, do we do this sometimes? Sometimes we do. Let us be honest. Let's be honest. And I am a part of it too. But this is why we are not able to achieve what God wants us to do sometimes. One, as I said in the beginning, that sometimes the words are of no effect. We present Christ in one way or the other. It could be through a track. It could be a word. But sometimes I do not prevail in words. Neither do you. Secondly, we have world in us. We are not completely separated. We are not totally apart from God just like Paul. Well, he's no comp- we are no match to him. Absolutely no match. But ex- is the commandment for Paul same for you and me? Yes. We have no excuse to make. Finally, sometimes we become the enemies of the cross just like sitting in the chair. Now finally, let me just tell you, the power of God is so great. Many years ago, in Rajasthan, in India, a man, a young man, I believe he was a pastor. For his missionary work, he used to go out and present Christ. He went to a very remote place one day. He traveled by bus for some time. He got on from the bus and he started walking. I, I'm not sure of wherever he went, but he came to a spot that was, was totally deserted. It was totally barren land. There was nobody in that place. He walked and walked and walked. It was a very hot day, of course. It's mostly hot in that place. And he felt so thirsty. But he kept walking and talking. At a distance, he saw a small hut and he walked towards the hut. He, when he entered the hut and saw a very old woman sitting right in the front of him. There's a very small place, a small hut. And then he spoke in Hindi. And that woman also replied in Hindi. And this is what the woman said. Three years ago, I heard the name of Jesus on the radio. My daughter was crippled for 18 years. And I didn't know anything. I just heard the name of Jesus. 
and that Jesus could heal, Jesus could save. She dragged her daughter, who was middle-aged, I believe. This woman probably was very old, and brought her, and she held her hand towards the radio and heard the name of Jesus. Instantly, that crippled woman was healed. She and her daughter accepted Christ. For the past three years, she had never met a Christian. She had never seen a Bible in her life. Never had fellowship in any church. Never knew where a church was. What was a church? And he, she asked, is that the Bible you have? That is the power of the gospel. Irrespective of where you are, who you are, if God wants to use the power of God, he can use it. That woman, I believe, was an idol worshiper. But never had anybody around that place, a barren place. But even in the wilderness, springs of living water could be shared to those who thirst. The power of the gospel, it was not for Peter alone, nor for Paul alone, but for you and me. The power of the gospel, which should be with words, not of wisdom of man, but wisdom of God. The power of the gospel is never, will never cease. Will never cease. And if you look what Jesus said, he told his disciples as he was getting ready for crucifixion, he said, your sorrow will turn into joy. He comforted his disciples and he said, just like a woman travails in birth and is sorrowful, but very soon there is joy because a child is born. Amen. Just like that, you will see me again. If we travail in birth for souls, there will be joy not only in you and me, but joy in heaven over sinners that repent. If God has got that purpose for Paul and Peter, and for many in the New Testament that we have seen, it's true for you and me. But we got to examine once again our own lives. Are we preaching the cross of Christ with words of human wisdom? Or are we not crucified to the world? as we should be. See, the desires of the flesh are very much related to this. Those people who are the enemies of cross of Christ, the lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Sometimes we fall into the trap, and we convince ourselves, whether it's social media, or whether it's something that we do every day, thinking that it's very much necessary for us. Maybe we're using it for our own personal gain, or personal interest, or personal desire, but we sometimes don't understand that the world is in our hands. And we do not win souls, but rather we are just like those people, minding earthly things and not focusing on the goal that God has got for us, pressing forward to the mark of the high calling of God. God bless you all. Thank you. Can we ask